Good evening and welcome to Chicago Music Poster History Discussion. I'm Jeannie Long, Executive Director of Chicago Collections Consortium. For those of you who are new to Chicago Collections, we are a consortium comprised of libraries, museums, and cultural heritage organizations, all working together for the preservation, promotion, and sharing of Chicago's rich history and culture. We do this through the sharing of member archival collections on CCC's free and open access portal, Explore Chicago Collections. We encourage you to visit Chicago Collections website at chicagocollections.org, not only to check out the portal, but to join our mailing list and be sure to follow us on social media. Also on CCC's website, you can find the listing of additional free public programs like the one being offered here tonight. We'd like to acknowledge the Terra Foundation of American Art for their generous support of tonight's program, which is being presented as part of Art and Design Chicago Now, an initiative funded by the Terra Foundation for American Art that amplifies the voices of Chicago's diverse creatives, past and present, and explores the essential role they play in shaping the now. Please check out the Terra's website for additional information on their programs and events. Tonight, I'd like to begin the conversation by thanking um, our panelists, Thomas Lucas, Alexandria Pataki, Jay Ryan, and Steve Walters. And a special thank you to tonight's mo moderator, Kevin Leonard, Northwestern University archivist and co-chair of Chicago Collections Content Committee. Kevin, let's get the conversation started. Thank you, Jeannie, for the introduction. And let me express my appreciation to the members of the audience for your interest and your willingness to join this program featuring some of Chicago's great printers and artists. I look forward to hearing what they have to say about their work, and I know you do too. Artistic expression can be intensely personal, but it also forms a record documenting the history of the time from which it springs. Artistic prints, print graphics, and commercial printing reflect individual sensibilities of their creators, broad stylistic developments, the economics of printing technologies, and in the case of posters advertising a variety of events and opportunities, evidence of the public's shared experiences. Sink your teeth into this item from the Chicago History Museum. Again, such work constitutes a form of historical record. The mission of the Chicago Collections Consortium is to acquire such material, preserve it, and share it with patrons who wish to understand the past and to appreciate how the past informs the present. Examples of artistic prints and of demotic print graphics and advertising and of prints associated with performance, especially music performance, will be found within the holdings of CCC member institutions. Such items are illustrative, illuminating treasures. I hope those collecting institutions will make every effort to enhance their holdings with the work of today's exemplars of Chicago printing and thereby secure in remarkably colorful and graphic fashion both personal legacies of the artists and the visual, and with particular regard to music posters, the sonic history of our time. So let me reintroduce tonight's group, Steve Walters, Jay Ryan, Alexandria Pataki, and Thomas Lucas. Uh, Steve Walters is widely recognized as the font of screen printing in Chicago, the creator of Screwball Press and of the extremely influential Screwball Academy. Uh, training program, uh, which has been the proving ground for so many successive generations of outstanding printers. Jay Ryan established the Bird Machine print shop in 1999 and has grown his business from creating uh, posters for his own band and, and the bands of friends into one of the nation's great screen printing establishments. Jay, as you will learn later on, I'm sure, uh, did his training with Steve at Screwball Academy. Alex Pataki, is a screen printer and scientific illustrator. Consequently, her work is replete with uh, animal forms and natural themes. She has been active with the Chicago Printmakers Guild and the Guild of Natural and Scientific Illustrators and is the proprietor of High Lonesome Press. Thomas Lucas holds degrees in art from Temple University and from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He holds faculty appointment at Chicago State University and at Harold Washington College teaching printmaking, drawing, and ceramics. He founded Hummingbird Press Editions and is a board member of the Mid-American Print Council. So Chicago has a long and important history 
as a center for printing, from newspapers, and magazines, and books, uh, lithography, offset printing, and now screen printing. Anyone who has taken uh, advantage of the area's live music venues or has become familiar with many books relating to the art of music posters, particularly Paul Grushkin's Art of Rock and Grushkin and Dennis King's Art of Modern Rock, or has watched documentaries such as American Artifact and Just Like Being There, will recognize that very significant work in volume, influence, and artistry is be, being created in Chicago. My question for uh, each of you is why? Why Chicago? I'm not sure. I, I mean, there. I mean, it, in the late '80s, early '90s, it, it was happening all around the country at the same time. There was Dennis, uh, Mark Arminsky in Detroit, Frank Kozik in Austin, and Lindsey Kuhn. Um, there, yeah, for some reason, it was just happening organically around the country. Um, and I, I think you know, Chicago became kind of a center because the record labels started looking at Chicago to become the next Seattle or Athens or Minneapolis, whatever. So bands wanted to be noticed. And, you know, prior to screen printed posters and stuff, it was all just black and white Xerox stuff. And something with some color on it got them noticed. So it just kind of took off from there. Chicago is such a hub of music. You know, anybody who goes on tour is going to pass through here at some point. So whether it's a local band, you know, able to work here because uh, space was relatively cheap to be able to have a practice space or have a workspace to make posters. And there were a lot of people here because making music and art schools right in town. I think that that's one couple of the key things that probably made us a big hub. I think the idea too, that sometimes <laughs> I used to hear people say how Chicago was a really big, small town. And I think that, you know, if you went to go see a lot of live music and your friends were in bands and you're making posters for them, the circles would start to overlap. And so it was kind of easy, not easy, but um, likely and organic that you could start making posters and meet someone else and meet someone else and keep making that work. So I think it just like allowed it to proliferate. Mm -hmm. You have the, the role of the graphic arts in the Midwest in general. You have had show print and your tradition of using letterpress to promote music um, in, in Chicago being the music center. Uh, you have blues and you have jazz. So that, that tradition um, of, of promoting the show through graphics um, was here. I mean, it, it goes all the way back to Luce, to Luce Lutrec, you know, promoting the Mamantra in Paris, um, but those traditions are here. It's a commercial center, Chicago, so a lot of people came here. This is like the biggest city in the Midwest, so it made sense to communicate what was going on. If, if I may, is there a definable look, a Chicago look, in posters or in, in print? No. No. <laughs> I don't think there is at this point. I think there was. I think there was a period in the. It, it felt like there was maybe a period in the in the '90s where, I think Mr. Walters here had a big influence on a lot of people who were coming out of his shop and and influenced the processes, where there was a lot of uh, hand cut type, handmade type, uh, a lot of um, collaged elements, and um, but I, I don't think that was a really a a, um, the work was, you know, varied depending on who was making it, pretty vastly varied. There was never any confusion about who was making things, but I think there was, there was one sort of aesthetic that was going on for a little bit, but it, at this point it's become too diverse. Not too diverse, but it's become very diverse because everybody's found their own voice. Steve, so many people credit you as, as the person who began so much of this work in Chicago and your training program has been extraordinarily influential. Could you tell us how you got started? What drove you to this form of expression? Um, I've always been interested in music. I was a DJ in college and, and tried to be in bands, but not very musically talented. Um, so I've always wanted to be part of the scene. It takes more than just musicians to be, to create something like this. Um, 
and I graduated with a degree in sociology and got a couple of bad jobs during the rush Bush years and got laid off and I had friends and bands that were coming through. And like I say, it was Xerox flyers then. So I started doing stuff with color on it. And, uh, you know, it, you know I, people encouraged me. So <laughs> I just kept going with it. Were, didn't you move into screen printing after starting block printing of seven, seven inches for yeah. somebody and yeah. uh, realizing how toxic you were going to be by the end of the year? Yeah. Yes, yeah, for I was uh, magazine covers for Speed Kills and Scott Rutherford had given me a, a pile of uh, inks he found in his basement and I was, they were all lead based stuff. So yeah, I went out and bought a screen printing kit and stuck with that. This, what, what, what are the characteristics of screen printing that allows allowed you or allows others to get into it is low cost um way of, of getting into the business it's not a lot of overhead it's it's mostly work so it's you know it's easy you know it's not easy but you know it's a learning process and a skill but uh you know i even when it, like, even when you're doing it primitively it, it i like the way it looks myself yeah. and uh you know you can make multiples in in fairly efficient way. Do, do any of you see yourselves as part of a Chicago tradition in visual expression? I, I realize that we now have a, uh, a wide variety of people who have found their voice as you said, Jay, but, but um, do you look to yourself as part of a longer tradition? I think um, uh, the, the community that has um, sort of embraced me and, and I've embraced them with the tradition of graphic arts through like the Southside Community Arts Center. And some of the artists that I've worked with um, kind of put me in the canon of, of print houses that have uh, established themselves here, like Landfall Press and Anchor Graphics, um, centers where they would collaborate with people to, to promote the print medium and promote its community sort of accessibility and um, you know promoting sort of all the techniques um, Chicago is a really vibrant place as it pertains to art centers and, and, and accessibility as it pertains to the multiple um, and the universities here. The history of art programs and print programs in the universities in the Midwest are historical. I mean, they're all established post-World War II. So there's a really intense tradition in the Midwest in general. But yeah, I think, I think there's a connection and, and a thing that we're doing to sort of establish ourselves as part of the canon. Thomas, you're, you're coming out of a, a formal academic environment, an established institution. Are you able to inculcate in your students um, the, the respect for those traditions or the awareness of those traditions that have helped you? Well, I, I, just like what Steve was saying, the accessibility of something like screen printing, like literally you can print outside, you know, and just like it gives them, they could buy a kit and get some water-based ink and just make it happen. They could get stencils, they can use contact paper, it's not sophisticated, and that's the entry point for a lot of the students to do something that's inherently complicated. When you say the word printmaking, you're just like, huh? You know, different than painting or drawing. Um, it's, you know, sort of uh, disconnected. But uh, screen printing is that entry point for a lot of my students, and they feel empowered because they can just start on their own. Yeah. Now, you and I had been exchanging a few emails prior to this, um, talking about individuals associated with the Black arts movement, Afro-Cobra. Um, does, does any of the work from that period inform your own personal um, the Well, the block is heavy block printing industry, uh, a block printing tradition um, uh, uh, that was being used uh, with uh, Dr. Margaret Burroughs and, and, and artists that were coming out of the center. And that just, that, that's another, that, but this is before the advent of water-based screen printing. Um, so it was, it's, it's an accessible medium, easy to carve, you can print by hand, that sort of thing. Um, so that that idea of with me in my own work, um, it, it is that sort of totality that comes with um, certain mediums that you could just do everything without sophisticated, sophisticated equipment that establishes the foundation. But then I embrace all the technology. I love the, the tools and stuff like that that we have access to now. It makes, the process much easier. Um, I don't know if you guys worked with like copy cameras, these big copy cameras and coda lifts and things of that nature. I mean, now it's completely different. <laughs> so you don't have to deal with any of that. Um, so I, I'm like, you know, I love the, I love the history. 
but I love the tools that we have access to now. It makes it even easier. Cool. Alex, I'm, I'm curious about your work. You, you, the, the type of work you might do for a, a gig poster and the type of work you might do for scientific illustration. How do those tie together? Obviously, we see form. I think forms they don't. <laughs> um, well, um, you know, I think when I when I started um, making work, and when I, you know, moved to Chicago, and I was in art school in Chicago, and like we were talking about, I was getting really interested in printmaking, and it was a lot of block printing and. Um, at Columbia, it was a lot of letterpress. I was got really interested in that, but you know, I lived in an apartment. I wasn't getting a letterpress and drawers of type. I wasn't, and I didn't necessarily feel fired up about it. I was still looking, looking, and I think I thought that the trajectory for me would be that I would be a scientific illustrator. Um, it kind of, you know, it it seemed like it perfectly married together my interest in the natural world um, and my desire to make artwork and make things. Um, but it's very solitary. And um, I just, I was in school and I was going, like everyone's kind of talking about, I was going to see a lot of live music and my friends were in bands and, um, I started seeing all these posters up and I could tell that, I could tell that they were the same people making them. And, um, and I, you know, the music sometimes is hit or miss, but to me, the posters were always solid. Yeah. yeah. So, so I just, I basically just was like, I'm going to find out who's doing that and I'm going to do it and I'm going to learn how to do that. And so luckily I kind of landed just right with these people that, you know, I met Jay and Steve somehow and, and, you know, like you're saying, became part of that um, Screwball Academy and then just, you know, stuck around and <laughs> yeah, yeah. try I, and, and I still to this day, I'm trying to figure out how does scientific illustration and screen printing marry together. Um, it's kind of been my, I've been thinking about it for 20 years, but I think like what, what we were saying about materials and how sometimes that changes and the technology, we used to use a lot of ruby lith, this sort of, yeah, stencil material. And I think that had to do with a lot of similar kind of look almost, or, or at least process in the group at the time. Um, and it never worked really well for me because of how I draw. And so I've been kind of thinking about it for a long time. And I think I suddenly, um, I don't know, I, I either sometimes think I really latched on a way to combine those two things. And sometimes I think I'm really off the mark. <laughs> uh, I, if, if I can follow up with two, two questions. Um, one is a scientific illustrator. Do I want to know what's in your refrigerator right now? <laughs> in the past, you would not have wanted to. <laughs> uh, yeah, specimens, specimens, yeah, yeah. weird parts, and I, I have the great good fortune of working in a building that has a copy, um, the elephant folio of John James Audubon's Birds of America, which is an incredible work of artistry and printing history. Yes. Uh, I have to copy myself. It's when you, when, you, when you learn about how how um, Audubon secured those specimens um, to to draw them. How do how do you deal with the, say the animals that are in your posters or or, or other works? Well, um, you know, interestingly, um, one of the collections that I visit the most often as inspiration for my work is the, at the Field Museum. I just mm -hmm. visit the you know, the specimen collections, it's such an easy way to look at something up close that I would probably otherwise never be able to see that close. Um, and they have a great collection of Audubon prints and Peggy McNamara, really great scientific illustrator and artist in residence at the field. Um, so I think like, you know, <laughs> try, trying to work from, trying to work as much from direct observation is helpful to me. 
but over time, I think, you mm. know, I had to keep telling myself, it's not always a scientific illustration. Sometimes it can just, you know, be weird. Number one there, I think it's that they're fun to draw. Number right. one, number one, you can, you can put a little aardvark in a suit and put them in a suitcase or, um, have a sock monkey trying to close the lid on a suitcase. Um, number two, um, I think that the posters oftentimes, and I'll come back and talk about this Andrew Bird poster in particular in a minute, but I think a lot of the times the posters are not about who's in the image. It's as much as the, the poster is a, like a verb, like this bike is crashing. This guy is falling down the stairs. Uh, these people are together, you know, whatever that, that verb is. And so um, I often will uh, use animals as the protagonist because uh, once you start making it people, then you have questions about whether it's uh, a male or a female, young or old, um, how are they dressed? How is their hair? What does that represent? And it's, whereas if it's just like a bear and a cat sitting together, people are able to see themselves in that and project themselves into that or, or, or oh. you know, it's, um, it's more about, it becomes less about who's being depicted and more about the, the verb, the action of whatever the poster is. So that's why the animals. Steve, if you wouldn't mind talking about these and, and uh, your intention and just your, your style of work. Um, I've had a lot of styles over the years. Um, as I, as I learn things, as I get bored with my current style. Um, this one here was for Red Red Meat and Califone, who were very important. Now, they were some of my earliest customers. And I, you know, they just I love their music. They, they inspired me to do some of my best work overall. This was a reunion gig, so I just, you know, it's it's basically the same band, California and Red Red Meat, with a few alterations. So I thought the Sgt. Pepper thing worked for them, um, and I just, you know, they they had certain characters they wanted on it, and I added my own. And it was all just cut out photographs that I pasted together and took a picture with my phone, and did four color separations and did it that way. And, but Dennis Hopper in the back seat in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From I think that's the the only poster tonight that's got Dennis Hopper and Evil Knievel in the same movie. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and Sue and Julia from Lounge Axe, and yeah. Uh, yeah, you want to go go to the next one? Um, yeah, um, yeah. I don't have any of my real early stuff, which was more just cut out Ruby list letters and stuff. But this was kind of a transitional one where I was kind of. Trying to go for the the Haight Ashbury style yeah. um, psychedelic poster. Um, there's not a lot to say about it. <laughs> you can go to the next one. Well, before let me ask a question about that. Yeah, yeah. my own curiosity. Um, you you talked about how you create the letters. Those are beautiful letters. What are you, are you using an exacto knife or how do you do that? Uh, the the outlines were just you know pen paint pen probably. And then, you know, the, the colors were all ruby lift. Uh -huh. And uh, I got a photograph from my, our friend, uh, Marty Perez. And, and that was actually done on, the, on a stat camera with like two different exposures. So it, to get that duotone feel for the photo. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is my most recent one, one of the few I've done this year since the, the shutdown. Um, and yeah, this is a style I use a lot these days. It's uh, you know, like old stamp borders and then uh, you know, clip art and, and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I've noticed in your work a number of examples where you'll have, a, uh, say, a human body, but the head of a different form of animal or, or a mechanical device. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, I kind of, yeah. I, I kind of overuse that, but <laughs> it makes me laugh. That's the, that's the thing, when I'm designing, it's, it's it, I, I'm, I'm happiest with it, how it comes out of it makes me laugh. Um, 
And and are are you your toughest audience? Are uh, you, do you need to please yourself or do you need to please your client? Ideally both. Okay. Um, I don't work well with a lot of art direction. I, I'm good with like a, a good vague idea of what they want. Yeah. You know, listen to the album and get a feel for it. So I'm like, kind of informs the colors and things like that. But I try not to do direct interpretations of a song lyric or anything like that. I'm not a good illustrator that way. But Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, and this is, yeah, a fairly old one. Um, this was kind of my second phase after Jay started working for me. I kind of realized that what I was doing was pretty pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, thought, yeah, I, I, I started working from a lot of old ads and like luggage stickers and, you know, uh, stuff like that and, and taking them apart and, and trying to teach myself design because I had never studied design. So I, I, you know, this was kind of my own education for myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, everything on there is all Ruby list. And then, you know, split fountain in the background. So uh, you use the word stupid. I, I, uh, well, I mean, why would you say that? I mean, you do great work. It, it's just, uh, it's really graphically striking. Um, I think it's beautiful. I mean, yeah, that was my, that was my thing when I started. It was, it was just to be loud and big and, and, you know, get attention and yeah. get, get people into the clubs to to see the bands yeah yeah and there was the the rule that you had to be able to see it from 30 30 feet away driving by at 30 miles an hour and get the base you know the basic info the, the who's playing where and what date yeah you know that was my main motivation but these last two slides are sort of what i think are sort of classic steve walters screwball as far as being like really successful sort of reuse of, you know, uh, an ancient image that's 50 or 100 years old and, and, and really like tweaking it and recontextualizing it and, and uh, collaging new elements in. And really, I think, um, really beautiful. And I think one, one thing I don't know if a lot of people understand, Steve referenced Rubulith a number of times, and that means he's sitting there with an X-Acto knife and cutting out these shapes out of plastic. So uh, this was all during a period where none of us working at a screwball knew how to use computers at all. And so this was all photocopies and exacto knives to get what you've built here. Yeah. I mean, th this one right here, the Wilco poster, you, you could set that up in, in conversation with a painting by Roger Brown, the, the, the type of the building with the, with the, uh, the windows and just the, the, the high contrast. Right, yeah. Okay. What's next? Jay. Uh, uh, this is a print for uh, Andrew Bird, former Chicagoan playing at Shuba's. Um, at that point, um, I think that that was during a heavy touring period for Andrew and I was, I kind of wanted to have uh, some elements, little references to songs, little references to things that Andrew had going on. Um, a pair of blue shoes he was wearing all the time, for example, a sock monkey that was always on stage with him. A um, uh, number of uh, stripy socks. And uh, I actually don't remember all the, all the references at this point, but um, all stuffed in there. And uh, yeah, pretty straightforward um, as far as being uh, you know, it's, it's all, it's all in, it's all in there. There's no background. Yeah. How, how many screens would something like that represent? Um, I'd have to go back and count, but I'm guessing probably five screens. And do you have a, a layering of, uh, I can't do the math right here, but um, I'm noticing, for example, on the top lid where the latches are is a different color than the sides of the lid. So there's yellow on top of some sort of uh, fleshy pink brown. Um, I 
I'm going to guess it's five or six colors, maybe. Great. Yeah. And then uh, the next one we just went back to, um, got to do this, uh, the hideout, the, the, the venerable tiny Chicago club um, that's being surrounded by Lincoln Yards. Uh, they were having their annual block party um, in conjunction with the, uh, the Onions AV Club. So they were having uh, all these bands playing, including the whole Steady and Super Chunk and, and Nico Case, and of course, Mavis Staples. And so the, this is all held in a parking lot across the street from the hideout, which is where the garbage trucks park. And this was, when was this? This was uh, yeah, in mid-September. Uh, and I was picturing sort of autumn and, and all the leaves blowing across the parking lot and all the garbage trucks kind of wafting up into the night. Um, I was pretty happy with the way this turned out. Tim from the hideout called me the, the night before the event. He probably called me on Thursday, the 5th of, the, of September, I'm guessing, and said, hey, we need a backdrop for the stage. Uh, can you maneuver this image and make it appropriate for backdrop? So I scanned in the, the truck part um, and uh, messed around with it in Photoshop and changed the proportions and made a banner that was like eight feet tall by 25 feet wide or 30 feet wide or something like that. I uh, got that to them at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, by five in the morning, that was hanging up on stage, I guess. Um, and then after the show, the guy, the manager of the, uh, the garbage truck maintenance building across the way, they wanted, they were complimenting the banner. And so it went and hung up on the side of the building for something like a decade and then got moved inside. So they took the banner with them when they moved recently, I guess. Cool. Okay. And then, uh, hi, Jody Shapiro. Uh, this one was uh, during a stage when I was doing, um, I think, really less planning, a lot less planning. And I, I guess I, what I'd kind of do is go to Kinko's on North Avenue with some text drawn and some drawing uh, parts and uh, photocopy segments uh, onto different size films and then uh, take them back and start to splice them together and figure out how things were going. And it, I was gonna have this sort of an oversized bike and figure out what was going on with it. But uh, I laid the films down sort of, uh, one of them was flipped and I thought that that was more of an appropriate um, use of uh, the, I mean, you can tell it's a bike, but it's uh, definitely something's not right with it. Something's been rearranged. And uh, so I ended up going with that, which was not what I planned to do going into the printing. So I think one of the things I've enjoyed as far as the way I've approached screen printing during this period was very much making it up as I went along and starting a print without knowing necessarily what the plan was. So this is a good example of that. Um, I sent the um, I sent the file to Ian Mackay from Fugazi some years later when he was asking for a JPEG of it. I sent it through to him and he, he kept sending it back saying there's something wrong with the image because it was coming out all scrambled. So uh, thankfully, eventually I was able to convince him it was that's how it's supposed to look. Intentional, yeah. Let's, uh, another bike. Um, I, I think aside from concert posters, one of the things I enjoy is doing these uh, cyclocross and other bike race posters here in Chicago. So there's an annual um, championships that happens at Montrose Harbor at the beginning of December. Um, and so one of the times that I regularly try and represent human, actual humans, as opposed to uh, bears or goats, uh, chimpanzees on bicycles. So um, keep it real, represent actual human anatomy uh, covered in mud. You always have a, a, a really interesting perspective uh, with your work. Odd, to me, odd angles or difficult angles. How do you do, are you doing that from your imagination? Do you, are you setting up models from what's um, going No models. I, I think I just try to, um, you know, I've learned from Steve and from other people sort of um, looking at the space around whatever figure you're looking at, I guess you'd call that negative space, looking at the, the way 
uh, type or characters are intersecting with the borders, uh, what the movement is across the page. That's sort of stuff that I've spent a lot of my high school years looking at uh, Trans World Skateboarding Magazine designed by David Carson at that point. And so the way he'd run type off a page or, or run, make the whole page sort of flow from one corner to another corner. Uh, I think that had an influence on me. Very nice. Alex. Uh, hi, all right. So, um, so this was actually um, a piece that was supposed to be a gig poster and um, sort of, I wouldn't say at the last minute, but around halfway through the process, the client <laughs> just got real adamant about it needed to be a totally different animal. <laughs> and I just still really liked the piece. So I continued on with it. Um, then it ended up being, um, you know, it ended up working out the way I wanted uh, and the other person was happy to. And it was kind of a good business lesson for me as well. Um, about, you know, how to have conversations with clients about what it is they want. Um, but for me, artistically, I, as I was making this piece, it was right around the time that we started phasing out of Ruby Lith, which we've all been talking about. And um, so this was one of my first kind of pieces where I used, and this was, I, I want to say maybe 10 years ago, I was using a digital pen and digital color separations. And it was kind of my first attempt into that. Um, I was trying really hard to loosen up. <laughs> um, and so the whole thing is much scratchier than I normally would have done. Um, and it was kind of, I don't know, Steve and Jay were both kind of saying like, you know, and, and Thomas, that that even if the materials are rough, like it can still look really good and interesting. Like sometimes that the rough, like a scratchy look can be really interesting. And I think that I had lived in this kind of headspace of accuracy for a really long time. And I had to really push myself to try and just try and loosen up and get and get balance out accuracy with some energy and um, so a lot of the lines are really scratchy and they don't line up and I kind of it was one of those pieces where I I think in I normally would have not liked that and then I just forced myself to let it go mm -hmm. I ended up really liking it um, and so it, I, at this point, I was just trying new things and trying to, um, expand kind of my process of how I was going to do these screen prints, um, and try a bunch of different things. So this one I think was probably only three or four. Um, so this is a gig poster for clip art, jellies, arts and letters for, um, Lincoln Hall. Um, and again, I think here I was trying to, um, I was trying to experiment with a lot of different processes and digital processes. So, um, I took a, my own, I took a photo, I took a drawing, I took some, um, acquired imagery and I just started to collage and combine, combine things and try and make something out of it. Um, so... <laughs> Um, this is probably the one that's the most, um, probably indicative of how I work. Um, starting with a, I usually do start with a black and white drawing, a pen and ink drawing. Um, for this band, uh, this was actually pretty current and I believe it was, yeah, it was right around the time the pandemic, like right, right as everything was about to shut down. Um, and this band was uh, playing at Martyrs, and they were these, um, it's, it's this really great sounding band, and like some others have mentioned, I think when I, when a client will, um, you know, contact me, I do like to listen to the music. I really liked this music a lot. Um, it was very rootsy, and, and then I started looking at pictures of the actual band, and 
and the, all the bands that were in it. And they were, it was just really interesting. And the band itself, the uh, headliners, they had um, the, a washboard player and the uh, lead singer. I, there was just this picture of him holding this ax and apropos of nothing, it was just standing there holding an ax. And I just kind of thought it was going to be interesting because I almost kind of always go with an animal. And I think that sometimes that's me and sometimes that's what people, you know, they're calling me because they want an animal maybe. Um, or when they start pitching ideas at me or their ideas, it's a lot of times they mention that. But in this case, um, the person was really just open and uh, kind of said, you know, whatever you want to do, maybe it could have a washboard in it. And we landed on this idea. Um, and I, it, it just went really well. And I think sometimes when, when something clicks in your mind for yourself, and you know that that client, that other person is really excited about it too. It made it really easy to make the drawing. Um, I was trying to make a, a hand-drawn font similar to what, the one that's on here. Um, I don't do a lot of hand-drawn fonts though. Um, so this is, uh, this was just something that I made. Um, actually, I made this for, speaking of Wilco, I made this for um, Pat Sansone, who's in Wilco. Um, we had been to see that winter show. Steve was there. And we afterwards, we were all kind of standing around down in the basement of the Chicago theater. And people were standing around and Pat had been, you know, he played that night and he played a banjo solo. And uh, he was joking that, um, yeah, sure, give the guy from the South a banjo and we we're kind of laughing. And as we were talking, just everybody kept walking up and asking him about, sorry to interrupt, but really love that banjo, really love that banjo. And, and he just kept laughing about it. And um, later on, um, we were talking about this and he said that his dad, he had been visiting his dad who had been sick and he told his dad how just every, you know, everybody comes up and asks him about the banjo. He played it for two minutes or whatever. And his dad just said, well, everybody loves the banjo. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and he just said, true, all right. And it was kind of a funny story. And um, I had made this for him to send it to him. But um, it for me, I, I think it's the first time I've ever used a hand-drawn font. Um, and I definitely felt like I was trying to um, make something that looked like it was glowing out of the paper. Um, again, that scratchiness is not, I, I do so much kind of, accurate measuring and then I have to really push myself into uh like loosen it up scratch it up scratch it up well you succeeded yeah <laughs> lovely okay Thomas okay um so uh I come I come out of sort of a little bit different space as it pertains to uh the sort of functionality behind printmaking. Um, I love all aspects of printmaking um, and studied all mediums. Um, and I have a mechanical background growing up working on cars and stuff like that. So printmaking, coming from a painting and drawing background, just sort of like lured me in very um, seductively using a machine or mechanical element and this, you know, sort of doing something that was sort of disconnected and more challenging to then get to a result. But then the other part of the, the whole thing with art in general is like, okay, how do you make money, right? So the business part of the art, uh, that was what printmaking sort of like brought to me. It's like this idea of the multiple, the idea of reproducing something and making it accessible to everybody. And that's really sort of like the core, the gig poster tradition, a lot of the commercialism in Chicago and, and the sort of opportunity that, that, that we have as, as printmakers to be able to uh, put the work out, or in this case, um, this is the uh, artist Carrie James Marshall. I, I, I work in a shop and, and collaborate with a lot of artists over the years to make multiples. And, and some of those artists, um, well, most of those artists are working in mediums that are not in multiple form, large scale paintings, sculpture, that sort of thing. So printmaking in its history has this wave of, of diversifying the group. So not everybody can afford to buy a painting or to have a sculpture um, in, in their space, but a print is something that's accessible. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's democratic too. It's like everybody sees it. It isn't sort of like something that has uh, different levels to it economically. Um, it, it gives accessibility to people. So a lot of those guys, those folks, they come to me to, to create a multiple within that tradition of print houses. It goes all the way back to Europe. Um, so I've been working with Kerry um, for, for a number of years. This is a sort of a recent block print that he um, uh, did and, and had to work with to edition um, for a publishing entity in, in Brussels. So often I, I work as an extension of the artist studio in addition to extensions of other publishing houses. Um, but that sort of correlate what, what you guys have been talking about. Um, the client in a sense is the band, you know, that's the sort of connection. And, and we're working within that sort of relationship. Um, uh, but the result is to diversify their body of work um, and to work out their own interests. I mean, Carrie has a, a genuine interest in the graphic arts, just like Rembrandt has a, had a genuine interest in the graphic arts and in, in not to pull additions. He would just experiment um, with the medium and, and take from the medium and then apply it to his own paintings. Um, so next. Thanks, Damien. So sorry about the uh, low-res image. This is Barbara Jones Hogu. Um, she's a founding member of Afrocobra, and this sort of connects to the, the Black arts history here in Chicago, uh, coming out of areas like the Southside Community Arts Center. Um, uh, Barbara was a screen printer. She, was a, she did huge screen prints. She's known for her screen prints. Um, and all that work now um, is, is, is she's being represented in, in a major way throughout the world, um, having passed sort of semi-recently uh, because of her graphic quality with her screen prints. And she's, she was printing old school oil-based screen prints. So, you know, real intense, very toxic process, actually. And I, I experienced that many years ago myself um, and at large scale. Um, it took 25 years for her to actually make a, a contemporary print. And that was with me. So I was, I was in for it when she kept um, challenging me with things like registration because oil-based screen printing ink is super opaque. So it traps. And trapping is allowing you to overlap and sort of deal with your registration layers. And water-based ink doesn't trap in the same way. So this is like a 13 layer screen print, but in reality it was more like 40 layers because it took that much to trap the layers in the way that she liked to build her prints. Um, but this is using modern technology, using Illustrator to separate it out into a reasonable amount of layers of color and then taking it from there and using photo emulsion um, and building it back up. So. Um, so that's, that's Barbara, and it was a real honor to do that. This piece is hanging in Southside Community Arts Center uh, now. Um, uh, next image. And this, these are a couple of the, the two next pieces are, are my own pieces. And as an artist, um, again, I love printmaking because of it's sort of uh, uh, tools and, and machines, but I love printmaking because each medium has its identifying marker, has its identifying quality. And that's, I think that's another thing that's similar between all of us talking is that sort of sensitivity that aspects of the medium bring to the table, whether it be the sensitivity of a drawn mark, the sort of scratchiness of a drawn mark, the reductive aspect of scratching back into something, to the, the quality of collaging something together. Even, even with Steve, with your work, this sort of like manipulation of a four color process where you can modulate the color on each layer. So it doesn't just become this reproduction, you have this opportunity to play with the layers. And it's like, I, I look at my studio, my print shop as a laboratory for that. So this is a piece called Mix Master. So it actually has intaglio, uh, lithography and screen printing all mixed into one as, it's, as if I would make decisions as a painting um, because each of those elements have a particular quality to them that I wanna add to the mix. But it just, you know, my history and music and stuff like that as well, being a DJ. It, it makes sense uh, to sort of have these things come together. Uh, next image. And it's, this is a piece called Liberty. And this is where um, uh, it's sort of things boiling down to the, to the essence. And this is what lithography does. This is a lithograph. And, and lith lithography is one of those mediums historically that has its history in posters, you know, as offset posters. And, and it's sort of like this idea of this durable, cheaply made poster using oil-based inks and stuff like that. And it's still pretty current, you know, it's pretty, you know, pretty currently and commercially used. Whereas is screen printing is sort of not as online, but the quality of a hand screen print sort of 
uh, uh, edition has now become very uh, valuable. It becomes very, you know, folks love that quality. I mean, one of the first prints I saw of Jay's was when I had my shop at Little Street Art Center. And one of your posters, and I still have it, was, was pasted up amongst all of the other sort of like placards that was advertising, whatever. And yours was up there, but it was, but it wasn't damaged. Like usually a poster is like this temporary thing and people like throw nails in it or throw staples in it. And yours was carefully put up with, uh, with scotch tape. And it was like this, I was like, huh, somebody wants somebody to take this off carefully and preserve it. <laughs> so it was like completely against what I sort of understood as posters, having those done myself. I had some posters done when I was an undergrad as a promotional thing for, you know, a, a book revealing or, or a library or something like that. So, you know, so, so this lithographic piece is sort of like this, this essence of like that medium, but specifically done as a, as a drawing, as, a, as you know, so showcasing one of the mediums that's used within lithography, which is wash. And um, historically, touche wash is something that um, is like it's, it's watercolor based uh, sort of medium within lithography, but it has a very viscous sort of quality and, um, you know, sort of a, just sort of this black stark images, image that has a lot of movement. And at the time, I was doing a lot of drawings sort of like this. So this is an image um, from that period. But um, and, and, you know, all, all the things that I'm doing with prints are really coming out of being a student of printmaking, the printmaking medium in general, and, and being lucky enough to, to have all of the different tools in my studio um, to play with, basically. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, time is growing short, and I have too many questions to, uh, to ask you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just cut it down. Um, and, and now I want to say something on behalf of the community of people to which I belong, uh, people who work in archives and libraries, people who collect things. And one question is, do you engage with Chicago institutions, the Art Institute, other art collections, or with libraries or archives to support or sustain your, your own work, uh, to inspire you, to, to help you in your creation? And no is a fine answer too, if that's, <laughs> if that's the true one. No. <laughs> okay. I have, uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a history with, uh, with Paul Gale, the former uh, head of special collections at the Newberry Library. Uh, Paul has purchased a, a number of my um, books for the collection there. Um, I'm, uh, but that's, about it for any um, substantial um, group of work. Paul's no longer, Paul has since retired, but uh, um, the Newberry has uh, a, a number of my uh, books that are collections of prints uh, there. Um, but uh, I maintain an archive of my prints and uh, keep most of my original drawings and all, all the business side of the, the business is all, is all kept and uh, uh, plan to pass that along probably to the Newberry eventually when I clean house one of these days. But okay. that's, that's about it. It's still sort of a vague, vague situation. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the people at Newberry are gonna be very happy to hear, to hear that. Um, Thomas, you, you just mentioned that you, you plucked uh, an example of Jay's work off the wall. Do, do you folks collect the work of other people, of other printers? That's, that's, why, that's why, you know, people would say I'm a master printer because I've been working with these artists and can solve any problem. But that's one of the reasons to collect the work, to have the work um, and have that collection that will go somewhere eventually. You know, there's been interest here and there, but that's, that's a key because I could not afford <laughs> to have the work from some of these artists that I've had the privilege to print. Um, so it's a privilege. And I, 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 you know, I'm a collector anyway. So yeah, uh, just looking at that stuff is really cool. Yeah. I think uh, something that's been really fun too, uh, when we participate in poster shows or anything like that, when you, when you're walking around and, you know, um, kind of maybe even trading with each other, um, 
I know I've kind of traded with uh, people on the spot and managed to now, like I kind of have a drawer full of posters from these peers and friends that kind of shaping up to a nice little collection. <laughs> Uh, Jay, Jay mentioned uh, his own works, original drawings, etc. Uh, what about the rest of you? Are, are you keeping the, the various states of your work? Are you keeping your correspondence? Are you keeping biographical information? The reason, of course, I ask is because in my trade, we're interested in this type of stuff. We want to know about you as, as people. Uh, so when, when uh, individuals of the future look back on the great work that you do, they'll have some appreciation of, of you as individuals. So are you saving your archives? I actually just um, kind of came to that realization that I needed to really organize that. And like Jay, I do save all my original drawings, um, but organizing them, having them photographed and archived, that's been kind of a project of mine this year um, because it's nice to hear that others would like you know, to see that record of work. But sometimes I think, um, you know, I just, it's gonna, personally, I want to have that record of my work as well. And, um, and then be able to do something with it, so. Um, I, I see that we've, we've generated, you have generated a number of questions coming in and we don't have the ability to answer questions from the audience now, but, but we have these, these information, these questions. and. Uh, hope we can get back to the people who ask them. Um, you, you all do great work. You are, are just wonderfully talented artists and it's been uh, a very special afternoon to have you here to talk about your work. Um, you have uh, made ours a, a much more colorful world thanks to what you do. So um, now I wanna invite you and the people who are listening to the program to, um, to come in and see what we do with the various institutions that make up Chicago collections. So we can, we can show you um, how we keep things and how we document uh, our time. And uh, I hope at some point, uh, our member institutions will be in touch with each of you to talk about your work and your lives and, and how we can better uh, collect and document the wonderful, wonderful things that you do. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks to everyone who came and joined us. Yes, thank you all very much.